I bring you greetings in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord in whose name we have gathered together once again this evening as God's people to worship Him, to fellowship with one another and to meditate His Holy Word. Praise God for bringing us to the second evening meeting of this uh, four-day Bible revival program. Now when the organizers uh, approached me as to what name they should give for this uh, weekend program, I immediately suggested we would have the program called Bible Revival Meetings. I have based it on the repeated prayer of David the Psalmist in Psalm 119. Will you please turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. Uh, those of you who have not brought your Bibles, please share the Bibles of your neighbors. And if your neighbor also doesn't have a copy of the Bible, please change your seats. And it is important that you switch off your cell phones and don't even keep them in the vibration mode. It is necessary that when we listen to the Word of God, we listen to it with all reverence and diligence. This is not an evangelistic meeting, but this is a meeting where we would be studying and learning God's Word together, and we would get close as much as possible to God's expectation. Now, if you turn with me to Psalm 119, and if you uh, look at a few verses, it's very interesting. Hear what the uh, psalmist says in verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. And you see the same prayer repeated in verse 107. I'm afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. And come to verse 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. So he gives three reasons why he wants God to revive him. And all the three reasons speaks about his personal frustration in his life. He is totally dissatisfied. He believes that he has gone away from God and he is not where God wants him to be. And he says, Lord, revive me according to your word. What does it mean? According to your word, what does it mean? Bring me back to the place where and what and how the Bible expects me to be. I just want to be where your word wants me to be. I want to be the kind of person what your word expects me to be. And I want to do things the way that your word expects me to do. That's what we call revival, genuine revival. Revive me according to your word. And in this context, I told you yesterday that during these three, four days, I would be essentially teaching you sound doctrine. And I referred to a very vital text in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is profitable. There is nothing that is unwanted or unnecessary or of secondary importance in the Bible. All scripture is profitable. And we have the fourfold profitability of the Bible. And that which comes first among those four prophets is the teaching of doctrine. The early church believers, especially on the day of Pentecost, after about 3,000 people at a single instance were converted to Christ, they were baptized, they were added to the church. We read of them, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. The prayer, breaking of bread, fellowship, they all come after. But primarily, they were established on the doctrine that was taught by the apostles. The word doctrine simply means teaching. Now it is from that, it's actually a Greek word or Latin word. It is from that word doctrine, we get that word doctor. A doctor, a medical doctor, he repairs. He sets things right when the body goes sick. So when you say doctor, it's a teacher. He just repairs. He changes the wrong thinking pattern. So when we talk about doctrine, there will be a lot of corrective teaching that goes with it. In other words, when we learn doctrine, a lot of unlearning will have to take place. Unlearning is more difficult than learning, but nevertheless, it is an absolute must. It is a condition for proper learning. You pull out all that is not right, and then you build up that which is right. Even in the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, He was talking about several disciplines like prayer, fasting, almsgiving. 
And very interestingly, you will notice, he said, when you fast, do not be like this. When you pray, do not do like this. When you give alms, do not do like this. So he started with do not before he went on to how to do it. So because unlearning is so very difficult and correction for any of us because of our inbuilt ego, it's very difficult for us to accept that we are wrong. Some of the things that we have um, cherished for years together, to suddenly say, yes, I think uh, what I have been believing and thinking and practicing is wrong. Now I have to change. It is difficult. But nevertheless, we must change. Revive me according to your word. If you really pray, Lord, revive me according to your word, you must be available for change. Change of your thinking, change of the pattern in which you do things. Now yesterday, my message was on deception. When the disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ, what would be? the sign of the end time, or what would be the sign of His coming. Even before Jesus would list out various signs, the first thing that He told them, or He warned them about, was deception. He said, take heed that no man deceives you. So if the first generation disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ could be deceived, anybody can be deceived. That's what the Bible says. Even the very elect might be deceived. And the worst thing about deception is the deceived man does not know that he is deceived. That's deception. And it takes time for him to come to his senses. Because he has lost his senses. He has gone into a subtle trap. He is enslaved. He has gone into a snare. He is sedated. He is bewitched. Now these are all words which are used for this deception in the New Testament. And various translations give various different words, but these are summarily what are normally presented. Now when we talk about deception, I, you remember I referred to an important scripture text in 2 Corinthians. We will begin with that for this evening's message. 2 Corinthians 11th chapter, look at verses 3 and 4. This was Paul's constant worry and anxiety about the churches which he planted. I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived you by his craftiness, so your minds might be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ, Simplicity that is in Christ. And he refers to what happened in the Garden of Eden. I told you yesterday. Now whatever I am telling now is for the sake of those who are not here yesterday. So that you have the continuity. If in the Garden of Eden. Where mankind had not succumbed to the first temptation. And committed its first sin. If he could be deceived. We who are living in a sin toxic world can easily be deceived. Not to be deceived is more difficult than to be deceived. We need to understand that point. And he takes the audience, when he was writing the second epistle, back to the Garden of Eden. What happened in the Garden of Eden? How did Satan or the old serpent deceive that woman? Turn with me to Genesis second chapter. You might have read Genesis 2nd and 3rd chapter so often. But when we closely look at it again, there are certain things which we find we have not noticed. Genesis 2nd chapter, verses 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Now look at the quotation that comes in the third chapter. One is the quotation by Satan, and the other is the quotation in response by the woman. Now the serpent, look at the third chapter. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat nor you shall touch it. Now God never said don't touch it. So here comes the addition. In the very first quotation comes the addition. God simply said don't eat of it. But here the woman adds, God said don't even touch of it. And there God said, you shall surely die. But here the woman, she dilutes it and she says, lest you die. Lest you die. Now that surety is no more there. And then the serpent said, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So you find three things have happened to the word of God here. There was an addition to the word of God. There was an alteration of the word of God. And there was also an avoiding of a vital truth from the word of God. Added, altered, and avoided. All in one stroke. So ultimately, it is how close we stay to the word of God that we will be delivered or we will be saved. It's like a second salvation. Saved from deception. Now come to 2 Corinthians and what is the first example? Paul serves for his deception. Keep 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians open. In the third verse, he speaks about your mind being corrupted and deceived. And then he gives an illustration in verse 4. For, you know, this is the reason why we should keep uh, some of the older translations. You know, the King James Version, the New King James Version, and some of these old translations keep the conjunctions. And, for, but, then. Now that gives the connection. But some of the modern translations, they leave out the conjunctions. Once the conjunctions are left out, you won't be able to properly to, to, to interpret the Bible contextually. So as much as you go to new translation, you should also hold on to old conservative translations where the conjunctions are kept. But, then, therefore, and, until, then. You know, they, they all will come. It will keep on developing one over the other. Because originally, the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. It was a continuous whole lot. After many, many centuries, some church leaders, for convenience sake, for the congregations, to turn to the references, they divided the Bible into chapters and verses. So these chapter divisions and verses can guide us, but they should not control our interpretation. So in order to do that, it is necessary that you keep some old translations also. Look here. I fear somehow your mind might be deceived or corrupted. And in verse 4 he says, because. So he develops the truth. Because. If he who comes preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted. It's very frightening, isn't it? Another Jesus. Different gospel. Now that's the message I'm going to preach to you during the next 90 minutes before us. Another gospel. A different Jesus. At the very outset, I want to make a very daring statement, but that's a truthful statement. Over 75% of what goes in the name of the gospel through media today is not the biblical gospel, it is another gospel. It is a different Jesus. It is another Jesus. It is not that old carpenter Jesus of Nazareth. It is another Jesus. And it is another gospel. Now the same concern Paul carried when he was writing to the Galatian church also. Galatians first chapter. I will read to you verses 6 to 9. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Underline these words. Different gospel. These are not words invented by a modern preacher. They are already there. So soon you are moved into a different gospel. Which is not strictly another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Distort. Distortion. How does distortion come? By altering. By avoiding. 
and by adding. That's the distortion. That's why I gave you the background of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And then Apostle Paul goes on to say, But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, then what we have already preached to you, let him be accursed. Why does he say even if we? The possibility of preachers getting back to So Paul includes himself. He said, it's likely that I myself, Paul, also might backslide. Depending upon the trend of the season, trend of the world, and depending upon the consumer demand of the church, I myself might change my message. And even if I change that message, don't accept it. And then he says, even if an angel from heaven appears. Now I want to give you some uh, mental picture. Now we are about 100, 150 people who are gathered here from various congregations. We are very enlightened people. And as we are seated here, suddenly an angel appears from heaven. Let's imagine. I don't think any one of us has seen an angel with a naked eye. Suppose an angel from heaven appears. I think every one of us will be literally flat. Or we'll stand up and we'll get so excited. We'll forget everything else. No, 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 here's an angel. And even if the angel says something which is different from what is recorded for us as taught by the apostles, let him be cursed. Let him be anathema. He doesn't say it once. And he says again in the ninth verse, As we have said before, so now I say again, you know it is in your Bible, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, than what you have already received, let him be accursed. No allowance whatsoever. You can't just put up with that. It's not broad-mindedness. Remember, Broadway leads to hell. It's not broad-mindedness. And it is not narrow-mindedness either. It is just Christ-mindedness and Scripture-mindedness. Another Gospel. When you come to Book of Jude, how many chapters are there in Book of Jude? Huh? How many chapters? Only one chapter. It's a single chapter episode. But a tremendous episode. That man Jude, I imagine, took up his pen or whatever writing instrument he had in his time and he wanted to write an epistle and when he wanted to write something suddenly the Spirit of the Lord burdened him to write something else turn to the book of Jude and look at the third verse beloved while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation you know, common salvation, the blessings of salvation, and uh, you know what uh, Christ has done for us, and all that kind of stuff. And I just wanted to write about that common salvation. Suddenly it occurred to me, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to fight earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Actually, what I wanted to do was a simple exposition of the gospel and the blessings of the gospel and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when I took up the paper and pen and sat down on my study to write, the Spirit of the Lord reminded me and He just impressed upon me and burdened me. You better warn the people against deception and deviation. I bring in another word this evening. Yesterday, I very many times used the word deception. Now, I introduce another word, deviation. And if there is the slightest deviation that is noticed anywhere, fight earnestly for the faith, not which was delivered to the saints, which was once for all delivered to the saints. In other words, revelation is complete. Which was once and for all delivered to the saints. Fight. Are you a Protestant? Who is a Protestant? 
A Protestant is one who protests anything that is contrary to God's word. I don't know about you, I am a Protestant. If you don't protest anything that is contrary to God's word, you are not a Protestant, you are a juiceless non-Catholic. Let me make that statement again. Are you a Protestant or just a non-Catholic? As for me, I am a Protestant. I protest anything that is contrary to God's word. If someone that day did not take up the book of Romans in his hand and shout that it is not by works, but by faith and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, alone a man can be saved, you and I will not have the book, the book of God, the Bible in our hands. At that time, everybody called that man as a heretic, as an eccentric. It's better to be an eccentric than being a neutral person. In neutral gear, you don't go anywhere, you know that. The only thing that is possible in a neutral gear is that you will backslide. If the slope is downward. Contend for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. In order that I break or end your suspense too long, let me just speak to you plainly as to what I'm going to talk to you today about. The another gospel that I have in mind, which I'm referring to, is the so-called prosperity gospel. That health and wealth gospel, that name it, claim it gospel. That gospel that all the time promises blessings, blessings, blessings. All the time concerned about belly and the material blessings. My approach today will be slightly different from what I did yesterday. I am going to tackle some of the very favorite scripture texts which are frequently and very often quoted by these prosperity preachers, one by one. To start with, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8th chapter. I don't want you to just receive all that I have said and swallow it. But I want you to be like Bereans. Don't be like Thessalonians. Who just receive the word joyfully. But I want you to listen to what all I say. Go back home. Do some homework. Search the scriptures. And see for yourself whether things are so. Only then you will be more noble minded. They even doubted Paul. <laughs> Who was the preacher? Paul was the preacher. Did the Bereans simply swallow whatever Paul taught? No. They listened to all that Paul taught. Went back home. Came in groups. Took up the scrolls of the scriptures. Searched the Bible. And they verified whether what Paul said was right or wrong. They verified even Paul. Now that's what you and I should do. And don't take things on face value. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 8th chapter. Uh, look at the ninth words. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. Oh, very favorite text. Jesus became poor so that we may become rich. Now on the face of it, it looks very simple. But you need to ask some questions. When was Jesus materially rich? Was there any time in his life that he was materially rich? Was he rich at birth? Was he rich when he was growing? Was he rich when he died? Was he rich even at his burial? Jesus was never ever materially rich. He was only spiritually rich. And he became spiritually poor. How do I say that? He was co-equal with God. But he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he voluntarily emptied himself of all the divine glory. Took the form of a servant. And became obedient unto the point of death on the cross. Wherefore, God highly exalted him. 
and gave him a name above every name. So Jesus became poor. What does it mean? He left his eternal heavenly glory. He emptied himself. He became poor. So that you and I today can be exalted to the heavenly places and blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Amen. You see how easily if you don't think you will be cheated. So Jesus left the spiritual glory to take the form of this flesh and blood as an ordinary human being. The Son of God became the Son of Man. So that you and I can become the children of God. He became poor so that you and I can become rich. <laughs> in the same epistle, Second Corinthians, otherwise in the 6th chapter, uh, look at the 10th verse. Paul was talking on behalf of all the apostles of his time. He said, <laughs> we are still poor, but we are making other people rich. We are poor, but we are making other people rich. Financially, we are poor, but we are making other people rich in their faith. We don't mind going through this difficult situation. You know, in the Old Testament, it was all material blessing. How will you know how far a person is blessed? How many camels he has got? How many donkeys he has got? You know, they'll count the camels and donkeys. That's the Old Testament. But as you come to the New Testament, you know, the testamental difference should be clearly understood. The Old Testament, it was all material blessing, essentially. But as you move on to the New Testament, as you look at Ephesians, first chapter, third words, He has blessed us with all, all spiritual, underline that word spiritual, underline that underline and underline that underline and underline. All spiritual blessing. The strong shift comes here. Poor materially. But we are making others rich. There is another text which is very frequently quoted by the proponents of the prosperity message. Philippians 4th chapter. And look at the 19th verse. <laughs> My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He doesn't say, my God shall supply all your wants, but he says, my God shall supply all your need. There's a difference between what you want and what you need, isn't it? Everybody wants three cars. Everybody wants three houses. That is what we want. But God has never said, I will give you all that you want. But God has simply said, I will give you what you need. You know, when you interpret the Bible, you should be very careful because the Bible is verbally inspired. This is where we need to also check with other translations, parallel translations, especially for these key words. Because most of us don't have an access to Greek or Hebrew. Now, I never had the privilege of studying Greek or Hebrew. So the nearest thing I can do is to keep as many translations as possible. I use about 50 or 55 translations in my study of the Bible. And especially where there are key texts, I try to refer all of them. Because I don't want to miss out on these vital, pivotal key texts. My God shall supply all your need. Now, why did Apostle Paul make that statement? Look at verse 16. This church... Compared to any other church, look at verse 15. You Philippians, you know that in the beginning of the gospel, that is when I started my missionary journey, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. There are so many churches. I was a blessing to so many churches. But when I set out on a missionary journey, other churches simply said, God bless you, brother, we will be praying for you. Praise the Lord. They did not give a check. But you Philippians... When other churches did not give me anything tangible, you only helped me. You only gave me some tangible help. And he says in verse 16, this is a history. Even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. The word necessities. I was in need of daily bread. I was in need of some minimum clothing. Even that the churches did not do for me. 
They received the blessings, but they never reciprocated the blessings. But you people, the Philippine church, you sent me blessing so many times. You sent me material blessings for my necessities. Not for my luxurious needs, but my necessities. Because you took care of my necessities. Look at verse 19. You know how it begins? It does not say, my God shall supply. It says, and my God shall supply. You took care of my needs. And therefore, my God shall take care of your needs. Are you able to see the logic? This is how you have to study the Bible. This is what I mean by contextual interpretation of the Bible. Never take a text out of context. If you take a text out of context, that text becomes a pretext. Keep every text in the context and interpret it. Go for a few verses before and a few verses after. Four or five verses that side and four or five verses this side. Then you understand a picture. That's contextual interpretation. Otherwise, the whole thing will go topsy-turvy. You'll be still using the scriptures, but you'll be off tangent. My God shall supply all your need. In other words, even this promise was given to a church which excelled other churches in missionary giving. Did they give because they had enough and more? No. Come with me to 2 Corinthians. This is why we should have a reference Bible. Most of us go for reference Bible, but we never study the references. Reference Bibles have got reference either at the center column, or sometimes now there are marginal references. When there are references, turn to the references. Now about this church we read in 2 Corinthians 8th chapter. I'll read the first three verses to you. This is the Philippian church. Moreover, brothers, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. In great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, and in their deep poverty, abounded the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, Yes, beyond their ability, they were willing. It was that church to which Apostle Paul said, My God shall supply all your needs. Not just according to their ability. Giving, giving one tenth or two tenths is only according to their ability. But these people didn't have even enough for themselves. They were not in poverty. They were in deep poverty. Are you with me? Look at your Bibles. They were in deep poverty, but they were manifesting abounding liberality. Are you able to see the extremes? Deep poverty. They didn't even have enough of bread for their daily sustenance. Out of their deep poverty, they were giving in abounding liberality. And the Lord said, because you took care of my necessities, my God shall supply your need. So this particular verse has got nothing to do by saying that whatever you want, God will give you. Never. Never ever. And there again it says, my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in. <laughs> you know, we should take the full verse all the time. Not only you should take it contextually, you should take it wholly. According to His riches in glory. Again, the shift is spiritual blessing. Are you with me? Do you understand? And there is another text that is very frequently quoted. To entice God's people and milk money from them. That's book of Malachi. Third chapter. Look at the tenth verse. Book of Malachi, third chapter, tenth verse. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing, that will not be even room enough to receive it. 
Can we take this promise uniformly, unequivocally, unconditionally? I do not think so, because this was a national promise to Israel. If you read the first and the second chapters of Malachi, you will find it was a national promise and God was addressing the people of Israel and Judah because they went after the various pagan gods of Baal and Ashroth. They left Jehovah. They have just gone away and away and away. It's not just failing to come to church. It is going to another temple on a regular basis. Going after Baal. Offerings, sacrifices to Baal. Forgetting the creator and building the temples for Baal. To that extent they backslide. Now God wants to somehow bring them back to worship of Jehovah. He wanted to entice them. When he wanted to entice them, he said, Now you bring all the ties here and you just see whether I'm going to bless you or not. It was a material blessing. The tenth words, we read about this uh, food. And in the eleventh words, we read about the fruit and the wine. All material, agricultural blessing. But when Paul quotes it in the New Testament, he very carefully changes it into spiritual blessing. Look at 2 Corinthians again, a ninth chapter. It's a very interesting study. 2 Corinthians 9th chapter. We'll read from verse 7. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or out of compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you, as it is written, ninth words. He has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. And what's the blessing? What's the blessing? His righteousness remains forever. And the next words also, now, may God who supplies seed to the sower, and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your fruits of your righteousness. You know the same old agriculture language he is bringing in here. And he says, God gives seed to the soil and bread. Let you now multiply your growth in life of righteousness. Again, spiritual blessing is what is guaranteed for us in the New Testament. Beloved, in the Old Testament, it was calculated giving. Now, sometimes people ask me, Brother, what do you think about tithing? Now, it's not what I think about tithing, but uh, the New Testament has no teaching on tithing. It was binding on the Old Testament Israel. For New Testament Christians, it is not tithing, it is total. Old Testament Christians will ask the question, how much shall I give to God? But New Testament Christians should ask the question, how much can I keep for myself? I know I'm disturbing a lot of you tonight. But only following a disturbing and staring of the waters, there will be healing. So, some disturbances are helpful. Deep poverty, abounding liberality. You have only two kinds. One kind for the offering and the other kind for your bus fare, return home. But as you keep walking towards this treasury box and looking at Jesus, if it had been Moses, you could have just given only one kind, but that was Jesus. Law came through Moses, but grace came through Jesus. Jesus was sitting near the treasury box. There's a shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's no more Moses, it is Jesus. When she came near the treasury box, she thought, Haha, I don't want bus fare to return home. I'll walk back home. She threw both the coins into the treasury box. Why did tithe tithing here? All the other rich people, Jesus said they were tithing. Out of their abundance, they gave. The tithing. But this woman gave her all. Then you are asking a question, brother, now uh, 
Only if you talk and uh, compel people to tithe, at least one tenth will come to the church, brother. Even if you that you open up and relax, oh, just now two weeks only we have got the pastor and we won't be able to take care of it. <laughs> Shall I tell you? For the New Testament Christians, tithing is a place to start, but tithing is not a place to stay. Only one or two say Amen. <laughs> tithing is a good place to start as a discipline. As a discipline, as a tutor. The tutor brings us to Christ, but after we are brought to Christ, we are no more under the tutor. The tutorship is no more there. Deep poverty, but abounding liberality. So hereafter, don't ask how much I should give God. Ask the question, how much I should keep for myself. Another text that is frequently quoted is book of Galatians, 5th cha third chapter. I look at the 13th verse. Galatians 3 and verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Underline that phrase. Curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What is this curse of the law? I want you to differentiate between the curse of the fall and the curse of the law. What was the curse of the fall? God told the serpent. In other words, there was a curse on the animal kingdom. What was the curse? All your life, you will only crawl on your belly. Then God came to the woman. And God told the woman, Because you have listened to the voice of the serpent, you will bring forth the child in pain. That's a curse on the woman. I want to ask you a question. Suppose one or two of our sisters here in this congregation, they are pregnant and they are approaching their full term. I ask you a question. Suppose the whole church goes on fasting and prayer. You think she would deliver without pain? Huh? The only possibility of delivering without pain is that you should uh, uh, do a cesarean for her. Your prayer is not going to stop that pain because that curse of the fall is not lifted yet. When did the law, when, when was the law given? The law was given after the fall or before the fall? After the fall. So that curse on the animal kingdom is still there. Curse on that woman is still there. And what was the curse on the man? Oh, your sweat will fall on the ground. You will have to work like that. How many of us were so happy? Because today it was Friday. Ah, a sigh of relief. Tomorrow is a holiday. Saturday is coming. Sunday is coming. And Sunday evening again. Oh, Monday is coming. <laughs> Maybe the sweat will not fall on the ground because you are living in an AC room. But the curse of the law is still there. It's still there. And there was a curse on the ground. It will produce thistles and thorns. You know in some of the underdeveloped countries, how much of money is spent just on weeding out the weeds and still people are not able to stop it. It's still there. It is still there. So on the animal kingdom, on the woman, on the man and on the ground, whatever God pronounces a curse, it is still there. But the curse of the law, if you don't do this, this will happen. If you don't do this, that will happen. That is lifted up. Here it very clearly says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, not the curse of the fall. We should not confuse these two things. Is there 
there any other scripture passage to support that the curse of the fall is not removed yet? Here I want to give another biblical principle. Whenever you want to establish a biblical doctrine or truth, you cannot do it on the basis of any single text. Everything shall be established by two or three witnesses. Some isolated, obscure passage from the Bible should not be taken to develop a full-fledged doctrine. There must be pairs. Take at least two or three verses from various places, because if the Bible says something important, it tells it more than once. That's important biblical principle of interpretation. Now the reason why I'm telling you all these things is I studied the Bible as a lay person without the privilege of going to biblical seminary this way only. And I want you not only to know to which is right and which is wrong, I want you to find out yourself which is right and which is wrong after this three-day program. I want to train your mind. I want to train your capacity of discernment. I'm not simply giving you fish. I'm teaching you how to fish also. So that you will escape the floods of false doctrine. That are already dashing the walls of today's church. And that will come in greater intensity. Because the Bible says the devil knows that he has got just a little while left. And he becomes all the more furious. Pouring out floods of false doctrine on the church of Jesus Christ. Turn with me to the book of Romans to see. How we take one passage and superimpose one over the other. And establish the truth. Romans 8th chapter, I'll read verses 22 and 23. We know, for we know, that the whole creation, whole creation, groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. What does it mean? The curse of the fall is not removed yet. The whole creation, that animal kingdom, the ground, the whole creation is suffering with birth pangs, birth pain. Until now, when Paul was writing the Romans epistle, until that time. And then he goes on to say something that is very important and applicable to us. Not only they, that is the ground and the animals, not only they, but we also, we, not they, but we, we also, Believers, God's people, we also, not ordinary believers, we who have received the first fruits of the Spirit, Pentecostal believers, even we, even we who have received the first fruits of the Spirit, the blessings of the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. There is a groaning. Is there any end? Is there any hope for us? Any bright rays? Yes. Eagerly waiting for the adoption. It is not now today. It is still in the future. Eagerly waiting for the adoption. What is that adoption? The redemption of our body. Today, beloved, only our soul has experienced full redemption. But the bodies are still under that birth pain and groanings. We are waiting for the redemption not of our soul, but the redemption of our bodies. Now the pain is there, the sickness is there, the suffering is there, unanswered questions are there, puzzles are there. Righteous suffer. Bad things happen to good people. No easy solution, no easy formula, no easy answer. We are groaning. Even though we have received the first fruit of the Spirit, we are waiting for the adoption that is the redemption of the body. I want you to just look at a few other passages to see how this total blessing is still awaited in the future. Luke verse 21. And look at verses 27 and 28. Look, 20, 20, 21, 27 and 28. Here Jesus was telling about His second coming. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is coming close. Do you understand? When the Lord Jesus Christ is just about to come and when He appears, when these things happen, your redemption. What is the redemption? Uh, this mortal body. This is a mortal body. What is mortality? It is a decaying body. What is life? It, life is nothing but walk from birth to death. That's what life is. It's a decaying body. It's a decomposing body. It is a mortal body. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do? He quickens our mortal body. What is the meaning of the word quicken? He kicks us up. Before it goes to grave too soon, it kicks us up. Which means, you have not received the full fruits, you have experienced only the first two fruits of the Spirit. You must differentiate between first two fruits and final fruits. Fuller fruits. We have experienced only the first fruits. The fuller fruits. The final fruits are still awaited in the future. That's why when Paul was writing to Ephesians first chapter. I'm, I'm going to give you a graphic picture. You'll understand it better. Ephesians first chapter verses 13 and 14. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, look at these words. You were sealed, sealed. You know, you know I don't know what, what you say in Malayalam, but in Tamil they say, Chapa Kutru. You know that? You are sealed, stamped with the Holy Spirit of promise. For what? Look at verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until... The redemption of the purchased possession. Now it is purchased, but it is not redeemed. You know what language it is? It is a carpenter's language. I will explain to you, then you will understand. There is a carpenter. He goes to a timber store. Huge locks are stacked one over the other. He just goes through one by one. And see the grains and the cracks and then the life and the age. He will be able to gauge. And then he says, oh, that particular log, the lumbar, I want. And immediately the shopkeeper says, oh, you need to pay this much if you want that. Okay, I will pay. He makes the down payment. That's the meaning of the word, guarantee. In some translations, in NAV, I think it is used the word down payment. So the down payment is given. The carpenter cannot carry that big lumber home to his carpentry shop. Immediately, you know what happens? The shopkeeper, he takes a seal and he stamps it on that particular log. It is already purchased possession of that carpenter. He goes home. He will say, at my convenient time, I'll take it. Then comes another carpenter. He doesn't look at this side. He looked at the other side of the stacking. And he says, I want that lumbar. And the shop gave, sorry sir, it's already sold. Down payment is already made. It is already a purchased possession of another carpenter. And why it is here? It is waiting for the day of redemption. How will he do it? It will be either shifted by ship, or it will be dragged on the waters. Until that day, it is sealed. That's what exactly. Today we are purchased possession of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that guarantee and that down payment is the indwelling Holy Spirit is stamped until the day of redemption when the Lord Jesus Christ will take us home. Hallelujah. I'm so excited. Now you ask a question, Brother Stanley, where did you learn all this? I learned it from Bible dictionaries. You also stood, should buy Bible dictionaries. Study Bible dictionaries. Bible dictionaries give you a background of each of these verses in the Bible. Because these are all various languages. <clears throat> Sports language, carpentry language, fishing language, agricultural language, military language. You know, it is all written in that perspective. So now we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise 
until the day of redemption. That is the final day. That's what we read in the book of Hebrews also. I know I am dealing with a very vital truth. If you understand this truth, many of your questions will be solved. Why, Lord? Why am I not healed yet? Everybody is praying, but I am getting worse. Some people are healed, but many people are not healed. Why, Lord? Many of you are going through a time of dissolution. And you will find answer to your questions when you understand this doctrinal exposition. Hebrews 9th chapter. Look at verses 27 and 28. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Now we are saved, but the full salvation, the full redemption is still in the future. A day will come. When you come to book of Revelation 21st chapter, look at the fourth words. Every time I read that words, I shout hallelujah in my spirit. And my spirit begins to dance within me. Because that's what keeps me positive all the time. Optimistic. Revelation 21st chapter. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will. <laughs> Today tears will be there. If tears are wiped away already today, tomorrow when Jesus comes with his hanky, he will bypass you. Tears will be there, beloved. If somebody says, don't worry, come to Jesus, all problems will be solved, that's the greatest lie ever told. <laughs> your problems will not be solved, your problems will start coming to Jesus. That's what I said, that's the original gospel. But what we are hearing these days is another gospel. God shall, it's in the future, God shall wipe away not some of the tears. This problem is solved, brother, but that's the only problem that's still bothering me. Every one of us, we say that. But every tear will be wiped off one day. And at that time, there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying and there shall be no more pain the curse of the fall is lifted up finally that's the final day now the wrong interpretation is taking these scripture passages and trying to impose it on Christians of today expecting them now this is for you today God will wipe away all of it God does not tears have a sanctifying value Tears are such a blessing, beloved. Do you know that? It is through tears you can see the rainbow of God. If there are no tears, we won't, we won't be what we should be. Praise God for tears. Praise God for tears. But on that day, every tear will be removed. Not until then. Until then, some tear now and then. A day will come, there will be no more death. Now everybody today, you know, you say, Oh, this fellow Lazarus must be a real lucky guy. You know, he rose again. He was resurrected. But you don't, you envy Lazarus, but I pity Lazarus. You know why? For us, only one funeral. That fellow had two funerals. <laughs> Do you know Lazarus died again? And did Jesus again perform a miracle? No. That was just a sampling to show his power over death. That was not a regular thing. But today, I don't know about your country here in the United States, in India, when some people die, especially some preachers die, everybody comes around and says, Oh Lord, raise him, raise him, raise him. Only what is left is the body begins to decompose. It brings dishonor and reproach to the name of God. So I tell you, if any of you die, or if someone dies in your house, first thing, send word to the pastor and ring the bell. Don't pray for God to just raise that word. It's not necessary. It's appointed unto man who wants to die. But there comes a day when there shall no more be death. Are you able to understand? You're, you're getting the picture? The, the broad picture of what God is placing before us? 
until then, until that day, both sin and sickness will be there. Sin will be there. Does it mean I can go on sinning? No. But if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. If you say you have no sickness, you deceive the doctors. Do you know everybody sitting here is sick? At least you have a pimple. That is sickness. A defect. Defect becomes disease, isn't it? Disease becomes discomfort. I mean, that's, the, that's how it grows. We all have defects. We all have imperfections. Physical, physiological imperfections. Everybody has. Some way or other. We all have it. So if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. Sin was the cause. And if you say you have no sickness, again you are deceiving yourself and others. Christ bore all our sins on the cross. But still we sin. Does it mean we should live in sin? We don't need to. We should confess. But we may again fall into sin. Does it mean God does not heal sickness? He does. But there is no guarantee that he won't become sick again. The full-fledged guarantee and the total redemption of our mortal body, this mortality will put on the glorified immortal body. You know, today we all have defects. Some of us are very sorry that our nose is not sharp enough and, uh, you, know, if, uh, uh, you know, our um, hip is not slim enough and so on and so forth. But you know when Jesus comes, you know how he'll be? You know how you will be? I'll tell you how I would be. I would be exactly like that 30 year old carpenter of Nazareth. Because my Bible says, we shall be like him. You think, yeah, I walk now and I'll walk in eternity also like this? No. We shall be like him. I believe in that. So that glorious day is awaited. It is that hope that does not disappoint us and keeps our spirits up today. Crushed on all sides, yet not getting into despair. Crushed, but not downcast. There is a beautiful uh, Tamil song. Nirkapattum Madindi Damal Kartar Dam Namai our nallavar, our kirubai, endumulad. Though we are crushed, yet we are not cast down. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Being poor is not a curse. Poverty is not a curse. A simple illustration. You know, in the Old Testament, it was given under the law of Moses, when you have a boy baby, male baby, you bring it to the temple to dedicate it under the Lord. And you also should bring an offering. You know what offering you should bring? You should bring a lamb with you. If you cannot bring a lamb with you, you are too poor to bring a lamb, bring a pair of turtle doves or pigeons. There was a woman. Her name was Mary. She was from Nazareth. She was too poor. When she took the baby Jesus to the temple for dedication, she could not take a lamb. She took only a pair of turtle doves. You think poverty was a curse? No. The angel will tell you, Hail Mary! You are blessed among women. Hallelujah! A person who could not afford to take a lamb for dedication along with her firstborn baby boy was hailed by the angel that you are a woman blessed among women. Poverty is not a curse. Let us straighten out our crooked thinking. Let us straighten out our warped thinking pattern. Even in the land of prosperity. What did God say? I am taking you to land flowing with milk and honey. In the land of milk and honey was everybody rich? No. There are lots of poor people. Deuteronomy 15th chapter. We should not forget...
to take the whole Bible, not take bits of it. Take the whole Bible. Deuteronomy 15th chapter. Read from verses 11 to 14. See what God says. The poor will never cease from the land. <laughs> Come on. Is this not a land flowing with milk and honey? Of course, yes. But not everybody will have enough. Some will have enough. Many will not have. The poor will never cease from the land. Therefore, I command you saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to the poor, to the needy in your land. If your brother a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, it is not speaking about the heathen man or the pagan man, you are one brother and sister. That's within the people of God. So that means within the church, there can be people who are poor and you are supposed to help them. I always have a question. Sometimes people say, poverty, it is a curse from God. Never make that statement. You are despising the creator God. He who speaks such things against the poor people is despising the creator God. If poverty is a curse from God, I want to ask you a question. We should never have any relief work in the ministries. Because when you have relief work, you are working against God, isn't it? God wants that man to be under curse and you are trying to deliver him from their curse. Is it right? I know, I'm just putting you into a very radical thinking. If poverty comes from God to a person, by trying to relieve him of that poverty, you are working against God. So never call poverty a curse. And never call prosperity a blessing. It may or may not be. Some of the richest people in the world don't even believe in the existence of God. Do you know that? Some of the richest people in the world are idol worshippers. Do you know that? The richest man in India is not a Christian believer. <laughs> they are idol worshippers. So poverty or prosperity does not prove anything. We should keep our spiritual perspectives right. Elijah was a man of mighty faith. He could bring fire from heaven. But he had to be fed by a poor widow. That too, not a wealthy widow, a poor widow. Not one or two, beloved. So, so many. I was referring to that widow who was coming to offer her offering. Was she living under blessing or curse? She was living under blessing. How do I say she was living under blessing? She was rich in faith to part with even the last coin that she had. I think that's a blessing, isn't it? God has made the poor of the world rich in faith. I want you to think and change your pattern this evening. That was Lazarus. When he died, why did he go? To the bosom of Abraham. But how was he on this earth? Full of scabies and skin disease, right? Not here and there spots. He was full of sores, the Bible says. So a man who could be taken straight by angels into the bosom of Abraham could be living with an incurable skin disease on earth. Possible. Apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh. It was not a thorn in his mind. It was not a thorn in his spirit. It was not a thorn in his emotions. It was not a thorn in his soul. He very categorically says, a thorn in my, in my flesh. I don't want to give any spiritual interpretation. Flesh means flesh, right? It was a thorn in my flesh. And it was bothering me. And what was that thorn? It was a messenger of Satan. What 
did he do? You messenger of Satan, get out from me in the name of Jesus. That's what the modern preacher will ask you to do, but he didn't do it. He simply went to the Lord, Lord heal me. He knew it was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. He recognized it. He diagnosed it. But I want you to know, Satan is God's servant. Do you know that? <laughs> Do you know that? The earlier we know the truth, the better. Satan is God's servant. God uses him for his purposes. Even Satan is God's servant. Everybody will serve him. I sought the Lord, not casually once. I sought the Lord how many times? Thrice. Which doesn't mean that uh, like uh, Jesus who prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane once, twice, thrice. It was not like that. The original meaning is he had seasons of prayer. Three seasons of prayer for that thorn to be removed from him. But you know what God told him? Paul, look here. You are better with the thorn than without it. You need it. Keep it. I won't remove it. He will constantly buffet you. Hit you. He will keep on hitting you. I want him to be doing it on you. But I will give you grace to bear it. Christians are disillusioned sometimes in healing campaigns when they see some people getting healed and many people not getting healed. What's wrong with me? If the candidate who comes on the healing line is healed, the evangelist gets the credit. But the one who comes on the healing line, if he's not healed, that candidate is blamed. What atrocity! Atrocity! It is religious nonsense! We need to restore the biblical balance to teaching. Are you sick? Let's pray. God knows and God can heal. If God, God does not heal, He is still God. We know our God can deliver you from you king. But even if He does not deliver us, we will still worship Him. And He will give us grace to withstand it. My grace is sufficient for you. If God had removed the thorn from Paul's flesh, you and I will not have that beautiful text in the Bible. My grace is sufficient for you. Praise the Lord for the thorn in our lives. If there is a thorn in our lives, somebody will get a good text. I have thorn in my flesh. You do not know how many diseases I am suffering from. I have throat problem. Just recently the doctors told me in the CNC hospital, if you continue to preach like that, I may permanently and totally lose my voice. Nevertheless, I've taken a risk and I have come here. That's why I'm keeping a glass of water here. I have a problem. I thought till I lose my voice, I'll continue to preach. Because I've been preaching all my life. There's a problem with my vocal cords. I'm a heart patient on strict medication. They told me I would be all right for 12, 13, 14 years at the maximum. 12 years already over. Not out yet. I am a hyperacidity patient. I have renal stones. I sometimes suffer from piles. But I do a lot of makeup here and do some dyeing and you know things like that and I can't stand before. You think, oh what a wonderful you know. Nothing, not like that. Nothing. It's a mortal body. In this earth and vessel, we are carrying the precious glory of God. The treasures of heaven. You take that out, this is nothing. I'm here because of the old Bible that I have in my hand. My mommy told me years, years ago when I was a teenager, when I was hesitating to carry the Bible to the church, because those days Bibles were pretty big, too heavy. I was taking the songbook, but I didn't take the Bible. I said, Mommy, Bible is too big. And she said, You carry the Bible today, the Bible will carry you tomorrow. And that was a prophecy for my life. I started carrying the Bible from the time I was 12. And the Bible is today carrying me. It is the Bible, not the aeroplane which brought me here. I stand here as a testimony. My grace is sufficient for you. And my strength will be made perfect in your weakness.
which means your weakness will still be there, but my strength will enable you to put up with that weakness. That's what it means. Beware of another gospel. When Paul was going from place to place on his missionary journey, you know, people took a hankies from his body and took in, taking a, a aprons from his body and threw it on sick people. Hey, they were all healed. Mighty miracles happened. <laughs> but when Paul was imprisoned, you know, he wrote a letter to Timothy. Hey, I am in this dungeon room. It is all damp and it is cold. I am also getting old. Bring my overcoat when you come. Fellow Timothy, he took the overcoat on his back and he brought it all the way to give it to that prisoner who was under arrest, house arrest, to Paul. Even hankies and bits of cloth from Paul's body healed people. But the entire overcoat what Timothy was bringing could not heal the stomach ailment of Timothy. How many times Paul would have prayed for him? Then finally Paul said, Hey, your stomach problem doesn't seem to be solved. I'll tell you one thing. You take some medicine. <laughs> they did not limit the healing power of God, but they were very practical. You understand? We don't have quick fix solutions and easy answers to all the questions of life. The more you grow, the deeper you walk with the Lord, the more mature you become, you will have more questions than answers in your Christian life. We won't get answers to all those questions. And God doesn't try, He's not obliged to give us answers. Even if He gives us answers, you think you can understand it with your chicken brain? Thank God, God doesn't explain everything to us. We'll be further confused. So better we just accept. My grace is, okay Lord, thank you. My strength will be made perfect. Okay Lord, thank you. Then what should I do? Okay, even in my infirmities, I will rejoice. I will glory. That's it. Don't go any further. I'm waiting that day. When I wait for the glorification of my body. Not just healing. Total glorification. This mortal body shall put on immortality. At that time, we'll be able to shout aloud that chorus of victory, death, where is your sting? Not until then. There was a great prophet by the name Elisha. He was the, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, he was tutored and trained and uh, the, the mantle of Elijah fell on him. Even, even the arithmetic count, you know, the miracles done by Elisha were double the number of the miracles done by Elijah. And you know how Prophet Elisha died? He died of sickness. Elisha died of sickness and they buried him. Another fellow died in the same place, in the same village. And they wanted to dig a pit. Maybe they were running short of places in the cemetery. So when they were digging out, and they put that fellow body down, that touched the bones of that prophet who died of sickness. That fellow revived. He came to life. But the prophet was still there. <laughs> you understand? We, you know, you can't simply have some arithmetic, uh, uh, you know, uh, rule formulae or some multiplication tables. This is it, that's it. No, it's not like that. My ways are higher than your ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. It takes humility on the part of us. Even though you may be an intellectual genius. To say, yes Lord, I don't understand, but I accept. We don't need to understand everything to accept it. You shall bring forth a son. But I'm not married yet. No, no, don't worry. The Holy Spirit come upon you. Suppose today the, you know, the Holy Spirit tells any you know, young girl here, I will come upon you, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you will become pregnant, and from the next Sunday she just goes about with her pregnancy. And how are you pregnant? You are not married? I am pregnant by the Holy Spirit. What do you think people will say? Do you think anybody would accept it today? Even though there was a president at that time, nobody will accept it today, but at that day there was no president. 
You think Mary understood whatever the angel said? Mary did not understand what the angel said. But Mary accepted what the angel said. In Christian life it is not understanding, but acceptance that comes first. It is not head to heart, it is heart to head. God kept two trees, important trees. One is the tree of knowledge and the other is the tree of life. God never said don't touch the tree of life. God simply said don't eat of the tree of knowledge. They could have easily touched the tree of life and they could have eaten that fruit. But man chose knowledge over life. That's always the mistake of man. He wants to fill his head before he can warm his heart. But God wants him to first fill his heart before he can think of his head. If mankind had taken and plucked the fruit of the tree of life, when God came in that evening, He could have given him the tree of knowledge again. But after taking knowledge, you don't need life. Only after taking life, you need knowledge. It's an important truth that we should understand. So in Christian life, when God says it, I believe it. When I believe it, that settles it. I don't need further explanation. Because it's the very word of God. But when there will be new heaven and new earth, these things will change. You know the problem with most of the prosperity preaching that we have these days? The benefits of the cross are blown up, but the demands of the cross are downplayed. Follow me carefully. The benefits and blessings of the cross are highly projected. Both underhead and overhead. But the demands of the cross are downplayed, not at all projected. That is why in prosperity preaching, the doctrine of sacrifice, suffering, giving up, living without, undergoing problems, they don't figure out. You know what they say? Christ went to the cross and suffered for us, so we need not suffer. But the Bible says in book of Luke 9th chapter, turn with me to Luke's gospel and look at the 9th chapter. Everybody turn to the Bible, don't become tired. If anybody should become tired, I should become tired, not you who are simply seated there. Luke's gospel, 9th chapter and verse 22. Jesus said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised to the third day. That's very good, yes. Jesus came to die. He didn't come to live. He came to die and give his life as a ransom for many. That's all good. If the Bible stops with the 22nd verse, it's good. But you should also move to verse 23. Then he said to them all. You know, I refer to contextual interpretation. Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and he must die. He didn't stop there. Having said about himself, then he said to all, all includes everybody, if anyone desires to come after me, ah, you please read it for me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross occasionally, no, take up his cross daily and follow me. So if somebody says, Jesus went to the cross, so you don't need to suffer, nonsense. That's blasphemy. That's what Apostle Paul said. Anathema! That is another gospel. Jesus said, I must suffer. Having said it, he turned to all of them who were listening to them and said, If anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and die daily and follow me. What is our answer to what we have been listening to? Father, I know you are a healer. Oh God, I know you are a provider. Oh Lord, I know you are a blesser. But it's not blessing that I'm going to be overoccupied with. It's not healing that I'm going to be very concerned with. The blesser, the healer, the Lord. That is theology. Theology. Theo means God. Ology means science. That's the real science and knowledge of God. The knowledge of holy, that's the true understanding. Whether it is a blessing or no blessing. 
whether there is healing or no healing, whether there is deliverance or only torture, my God is always on the throne. And I will worship Him. When I die, people may stone me. The Bible says, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those who fear Him and deliver them. But that day when Stephen was stoned, where did all the angels go? Did they go on marketing or vacationing? Did they go on furlough? Every stone pelted on Stephen, hit him, and he, he was bleeding to death. Whether the angels guard you or not, that's immaterial. I see my Lord standing up there. His face was shining like the face of an angel. You can't imagine a person who was bleeding all over and facing. You know, even if a small finger is cut, we bother everybody at home. Small finger. You should see your face when you have a small cut. The real face is only there. But that is the fellow was bleeding all over. But his face was like the face of an angel. My strength will be made perfect in your weakness. So I will rejoice more in my weaknesses that the power of God may be manifested. Shall we all stand up in the presence of God? Eyes closed and heads bowed down and hearts lifted up in humble adoration and worship because He is Lord. Jesus became poor to make us rich, yes. Though he was equal with God, he considered it not a robbery or something to be grasped. But he humbled himself. Nobody humiliated him. He humbled himself, voluntary. He emptied himself. That was again voluntary. Took the form of a servant and was obedient unto death. Wherefore God highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. And blessed be the name of the Lord God who has blessed us in heavenly places with all spiritual blessings in Jesus Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you for your holy word. Thank you for the rebuke and correction that came to us tonight. Help us, O God, to stay in this biblical understanding with a proper perspective and not get distorted or deviated and finally deceived. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, through whose help alone we could understand your word. I pray for all those who have come here this evening with lots of questions. Why my prayer for this problem is not solved yet or not answered yet? Why I am not healed yet? So many people have prayed once, twice, thrice, but I am not healed yet. If God wants to heal me, He knows how to heal me and when. But whether he heals me or not, that's immaterial. I have the assurance that the Holy Spirit is given as a down payment and I am stamped for eternity. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.